So thank you uh, everyone for coming uh, today. Um, so this event is brought to you by datatalks.club. So this is a community of people interested in different uh, uh, aspects of uh, data, data scientists, machine learning engineers, uh, data engineers, uh, product managers, uh, and so on. So we have weekly events. Um, we have events with uh, presentations. So next week we'll have an event uh, um, about serverless machine learning with AWS um, uh, Lambda. Then a week after that, we'll talk about a new service from AWS called AWS Glue Data Brew. So these events happen on uh, Tuesday, uh, uh, 5 p.m. Uh, European time. And we also have events on Friday, such as uh, uh, this event, where we have more like a conversation. So this is a type of event without slides. We just talk on a particular topic. And today, uh, that will talk about building a data science team. Then next week, we'll talk about standing out uh, as the data scientist during the recruitment process. And uh, the week after that, I didn't put it on slides yet, we'll talk about uh, mentoring. Um, we will, uh, during our, now we will start uh, talking with that. Uh, while we have our conversation, uh, at any time, feel free to ask your question using Slido. I will share a link now. Uh, so if you want to ask something, just go to Slido. Ask your question, and then at the end, we will go through your questions and answer them. I will uh, send the link now to uh, chat. You will have it now. So now you have the link. <coughs> and then, so let me just quickly take my notes. Uh, so today we have a pleasure uh, to um, to have that as a guest. So that uh, needs no introduction. So if you have a LinkedIn account, you probably already know him. Um, if you don't uh, have a LinkedIn, a LinkedIn account, um, that has a lot of experience in uh, building data teams. And this will be the topic today. So he uh, led a team at Idealo. This is a popular price comparison tool in Germany. Um, then he was a head of AI at Axel Springer. This is a big publication house. And now he is the CTO and the co-founder of Priceloop. So thank you, Dad, for coming to the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, I say. <laughs> yes, um, we'll start with uh, your background. So can you please tell us uh, how you started your career? So how you got uh, into machine learning and uh, how this, this all led to becoming a CTO of your own startup? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think my, uh, I would say the, my career is not very straightforward. So I, I didn't really study computer science uh, or something like this, uh, which would probably like naturally uh, like grow into like the area of machine learning or like, you know, just software engineering in general. So I actually uh, studied uh, um, business, so actually economics um, um, at Humboldt University, and I was actually more into investment banking. Uh, but uh, you know, when I, since I was a child, I was a lot into gaming, and uh, because due to gaming, I also uh, got into coding. You know, I I, I um, started to do co coding very early. Uh, I think with twelve or thirteen, you know, I created my first. Uh, HTML websites and uh, uh, CSS. I did my own uh, forum and all stuff. And then over the time, I um, got into more uh, of these these areas. And then I learned to 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 program as well. You know, I learned um, like Turbo Pascal, Delphi, and so on. So uh, uh, and over the basically when I and while I was investment banking. I solve a lot of problems with with coding uh, and programming. So we're basically, you know, where my peers, they it's it's like a very monkey business. You know, you have to copy and paste. You know, you sit until two or three a.m. and you do copy and paste of things. Where I just wrote like a simple VBA, like a Visual Basic uh, script uh, for application on on Excel, right? Which solved my problem within two minutes. Where my peers was working for three to four hours, and I was thinking. Okay, maybe I should do something with, like, you know, with software engineering, <laughs> because uh, the job that I'm doing right now, like, of course, it's well paid, but it's a, it's a, it's really a monkey business. 
Um, and then I, I went back to, to my graduate studies. Uh, I, I majored in, in operation research and uh, econometrics. And, uh, and, um, and then, yeah, a friend of mine, you know, uh, he was studying statistics in Munich. Uh, and he told me, hey, well, there's this cool course, uh, machine learning uh, by entering you, you should do it, right? And then I think a lot of people who did that course at that time, uh, I think it was six years ago or something, or six or seven years ago, I did that course and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that sounds interesting what he's, what he's doing. And, uh, and basically a lot of the stuff that he actually said in the course is, is something that I already did in, uh, at university, but it was branded liberally, right? Because now he called it supervised learning uh, for linear regression problems, right? So I was like, ah, okay. So I know some of this stuff and, uh, uh, and now it's like, you know, I have a little bit of machine learning context, but actually also how you would actually apply it in, in a real world, like in for business world, right? Uh, because you know, and, and when you while you're studying, you just learn concepts, you, you learn theorems, right? And and you just don't know how to use it um, in real life. Um, and then, uh, of course, at the end, I had to decide: okay, uh, where do I want to go? Right? So, uh, should I do a PhD or uh, go uh, to the industry? And uh, luckily, the uh, Accenture at the time was having a new team it's called uh, Advanced Analytics. Um, and then I decided, okay, um, I should apply there because it's a new team, you know, uh, there, um, it was not the time doing a lot of data science or something like that. It was, I think, simple statistic, but they were more into like, you know, six or seven years, everyone was into big data, right? So, you know, you had to learn this kind of Spark, but of course in Spark, they had simple stuff like linear regression and logistic regression. Uh, but that was not really my biggest interest because I knew at the time that big data was not was was just very difficult to do right so a lot of people just thought that it's so simple to do because yeah who brought up MapReduce at the time and everyone was thinking okay in germany that would work as well but uh, that was very difficult uh, so that's why my focus was more rather into starting the data science practice in accenture so i was one of the first one who did like really a data science project here in germany um but then also uh, uh i realized that yeah, a company like Accenture is not something um, that I wanted to work for a long time. So I, I left it uh, pretty early. Um, the reason is, um, you know, Accenture is a big company. It's a consultancy, right? So there's still a lot of overhead that you need to do. For example, you know, you need to do a lot of presentations. You need to talk to clients. It's more like project management. And then you have people in India who are, or maybe also in, in Spain, you know, this offshore uh, center where you basically, you have people who actually do the delivery. So who really code, right? And my goal was like, okay, I'm, I'm still pretty young and I like to code. You know, I don't want to spend my whole time just, you know, working on concepts, you know, and then, you know, uh, not doing the real thing. <clears throat> and then I, um, I moved on after a year or something. I joined uh, Pivotal. Pivotal is uh, a US software company. Uh, the main focus was actually to do uh, Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is similar to uh, Kubernetes. So, um, and uh, I joined um, Pivotal Data, where basically, you know, you have uh, databases like Creamplum. It's also similar to, to uh, like uh, Snowflake or Redshift, right, on AWS. Like it's an MPP database. And they also have a data science team, which basically help customers to how to like teach them how to do this data science, right? And it's also consultancy, uh, but uh, like a more hands-on consultancy, right? So really at Pivotal, uh, I, I learned, you know, I, I got to know one of the like the best engineers actually on the like one of the, in the world, right? So uh, they taught me a lot of things like what's programming, what's test room development, uh, DevOps skills, you know, how you actually, you know, uh, bring data science into production, right? Which was quite new, like five years ago at the time, because, you know, everyone was talking about that, but no one really understood, like how you really get a data science or machine learning model into production. And uh, at that time, I, I learned a lot about this concept. I devised my own ideas, right? How, you know, uh, to make it uh, to make it happening, right? Because at the time, no one was really thinking about that because everyone was thinking, wow, wow, how do you create this fancy machine learning model and do this and that and do, you know, all the hyper parameter tuning and so on. But no one really thought about, hey, okay, but what happens afterwards, right? What happened after day two, right? Day one, okay, it's in production, but what's day two, day three, day five, day six, right? Because it's, it's not a simple, uh, like, you know, app, you know, even an app, when you create an app, you know, you have more feature requests, you have feature development, you know, bugs were coming up and you need to think about that, right? And this is something 
um, that was pretty cool. And other than that, I also had to work on nice projects. You know, I did my pet projects as well. I, I got uh, I got into computer vision a lot, uh, and also I work on interesting projects like, for example, uh, hydro planning prediction. I work for many interesting customers, and I could also travel to. Uh, many nice locations because you know uh, Pivotal was based in Silicon Valley. They had their main uh, European office in London, so it was very cool uh, experience that I had with Pivotal. Um, um, but then, of course, after three years of consultancy, so I left Pivotal after two years. I realized hmm, this is you know consultancy is is nice. You know, you you see different customers, you 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 get to know different problems. But actually, you know, I was I I mean. As I said, I started to think about this while I was at Pivotal about machine learning and production, right? <laughs> and then I was like, okay, how do I actually, you know, find a company where I can actually test my ideas, you know, and the stuff that I learned at Pivotal and you know think that is good. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and then I then I what I did was then uh, okay, uh, I looked up for some companies uh, which was interesting for me at the time. Uh, I applied at, at several companies, you know, uh, and of course, there were also a lot of headhunters who, you know, told me, okay, uh, this company is interesting. And I interviewed for like Deutsche Bahn, Telekom, and whatever. Um, but, but then, you know, none of these bigger companies, you know, were, was really interesting for me because at that time I was actually looking for a head of a data role, like a more managerial role. Uh, but you know, you know, in Germany, usually when you just having three years of work experience, you never get like you know this managerial role because they will ask you, okay, you're too young, uh, you don't really have the experience to 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 showcase this, right? Um, but despite that, um, I I uh, like there was this position in opening at Idealo, and actually the role required to have I think eight years of work experience, right? So I was, but you know. <laughs> naive me, <laughs> naive me. What else? What else? What I? What did I? What, what did I do? Of course, I applied, right? Um, and luckily, um, it went through. So the CTO liked my CV. We had a first conversation. Uh, after this conversation, you know, I talked to the CEO, you know, the CPO, and so on. Uh, and then I think the process only took two weeks. Uh, and the coolest thing is. You know, uh, while I was in the meeting with the CEO and CPO and CTO, actually, when we met uh, on site, I could actually sh like, you know, like do like a little presentation about what you can expect from me, you know, in the next two years. You know, what do you expect from me? You know, what, what are my plans and so on? So that was, that, that was a, I think, a very interesting kind of like uh, experience, like going through like, you know, uh, like, a, like a, a job application, right? Because it was not like the usual one. Okay, uh, we have this role, and you're gonna fill out this role. But I was literally creating my own role in the sense, right? Um, and then yeah, I was hired as a, a head of data. Um, I was responsible, you know, with other two co-heads for for areas like uh, uh, business intelligence, data warehouse, uh, web analytics. Uh, but then also, you know, while my while I was at the interview, I also pitched. Hey, we need a data science machine learning team, you know, because Idealo is a data company, uh, but you really haven't made use of all the data that you have at the moment, you know, uh, for for all this stuff. Uh, and and the rest is story, you know. I, I basically uh, managed to like, you know, my two years at Idealo. Uh, I I would say from my perspective, you know, was really successful. So I hired a a, a, a nice team out of the people that I had. Uh, uh, um, why was the time we did a lot of open source projects, you know, we, we kind of built a brand for, for Idealo that, you know, now they still have a strong machine learning team, right? It's not like, you know, when I left, you know, Idealo, wow, everything is gone, right? So everything that I do is also trying to build a very um, sustainable culture, you know, in the company. So I don't want to leave a company uh, with, with, with everything, but I just want to leave a piece there, you know, like that I that I build up. So that was something that um, I really liked. Um, but no, but after two years of uh, Diallo, I, I mean, I also realized, okay, uh, I built up this team very successfully. Uh, what's next? You know, so I cannot stay there forever in 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 a way because I was young. Uh, I was like, okay, uh, I, I managed to do that. I did my learnings, but what is next step, right? Uh, and then I decided, okay. I did it for Idealo, 
but how do you do this on a on a corporate level you know idealo is a corporate but how do you do it when you like you know ox is the same thing to extra springer like a holding right so if you have multiple units right how would you do that if you are in a holding uh, what kind of learnings would you do right um and then and then it was like okay i i really like this ai topic um and i really you know as a springer at the time like one and a half year ago it was like there was no direction of they didn't know what research was right it's not, it's not a company that is driven by research because they just don't know what research is right but i think you know if you if you want to be a tech company and actually springer is is one of the companies that is aspiring to be a tech company you really need this research and open source component you know within the whole holding and uh i was thinking you know I, and then i was approaching uh, Stefan, Stefan Kasper, she's one of the board members of Axel Springer. I was telling her, hey, this is my dears, you know, what about if we try to create this uh, main central function, you know, and basically evangelizing around Axel Springer, you know, uh, what AI is about, what research is about, and how we actually can work together, right? And actually, my one of the driving factors why I did that is actually, you know, I want to turn Axel Springer into a tech company. So it's not, you know, just taking the AI angle to turn it into like a more a tech oriented company. Um, and then I did it, uh, yeah, I did it for one and a half years. Uh, I built up very fast the AI team again because I, I took some of the people with me from Idealo. They wanted to come with me. I had a few people. And my role there was basically, I mean, sometimes it's just called I'm a cheerleader, you know, because I didn't have a lot of like people function, right? But more like, how do you basically? Uh, talk to the to the managing directors, you know, to the management, uh, and basically uh, shape them so that they go into the right direction, right? Because it's much harder uh, when you do this because management is very difficult, right? It's not like you know you have a team and uh, uh, this team is some one you hired, right? But now you have many many different like managers on the same level, right? And how do you make sure that they are going the direction uh, that you wanted to go? Um, and I also. You know, um, I think when looking back at my time at Axel Springer, uh, there were a lot of up and downs, right? So the downside, of course, it's a big corporate. Uh, I think it was a big challenge for me. So I, I think uh, at the time I thought, okay, two years is enough again, right? To kind of do this whole transformation. But uh, I think it take, will take much longer than to do this transformation on a, on an organization standpoint. And also one thing that I didn't um, think through was, hey, to do this kind of transformation, you just need much more people under you to drive this transformation and also kind of budget, you know, like really uh, profit and loss uh, ownership. Um, but despite that, I think I managed to drive a lot of things as well, you know, managed to cover off open source projects again. Um, um, I was one of the initiator of the Axel Springer TechCon, which is like the first like big tech on this, uh, our conference, you know, that we had within Axel Springer. So if, like pre-corona, you know, we, we, when we did it, we had like 700 participants from all around the world. So that was really, really one of the, one of the first big thing, you know, where we could say, hey, we're driving Axel Springer in the right direction of being a tech company, right? Uh, and also uh, the other point was when we uh, did the Axel Springer tech block, right? So like, you know, where people within the holding, you know, uh, within the, uh, companies can create articles and blog posts on this uh, tech block, right? So this is something that is still living kind of, you know, after I'm gone. And I, and I really like it that it's still kind of like growing in some way, right? Because I started it. And, you know, and if, if I think about this again, these are, these are really where small things, you know, not very big things that, that I did in a way and, and that everyone could do. But, you know, you just needed someone to do that, you know, to start this thing so that people will, you know, you, you start basically give them the, 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 the freedom to basically write articles, you know, or go to this uh, conference and so on, right? Um, yeah, and then recently, um, you probably, some of you seen that, I, I uh, resigned from Axel Springer. Uh, so I had this uh, mind already, you know, when I joined Axel Springer that, okay, I'm not going to stay there forever. I'm uh, either going to do my own things or, you know, find a nice, like, managing director, uh, slash like it's very top management position so that I can drive more things, right? Because at the end of the day, my credo is always, you know, um, you need more ownership and sometimes ownership comes with power, right? And power is sometimes that you either acquire through like a manager, manager director positions 
or you create your own company, right? Because this is this is how the way when you really want to drive things forward by yourself. Um, and no, and um, so during Corona time, you know, the idea came much stronger. I was like, mm, okay, everything is so slow. Everything at Upstream is so slow. You know, it's a COVID world. You cannot be there forever, right? Because you're still 32. You know, you're not 45. You don't have a family yet, right? So you really need to go out and still think about, okay, what's the next step? And uh, then I was like, um, I was talking to a few friends and da, da, da. maybe one idea was, okay, maybe you go back to um, Vietnam. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not from Vietnam, I'm, I'm from Germany, but uh, maybe go to Vietnam and build a consultancy because the, the tech is growing strong there, you know, and, and, and maybe some of, maybe an idea grows out of this, right? But luckily um, my, my current co-founder, so Dr. Richard Schwenke, uh, he approached me, uh, really, you know, we, we left at the same time from our companies. Uh, Richard uh, co-founded uh, Contorion already, which is a, a e-commerce for, for like, uh, you know, tooling and so on, um, like for B2B business. And uh, he, he co-founded the company, was, he was the managing director, uh, but he sold the company uh, in 2017 already. So, and he actually wanted to create another company again, you know, to, to have this, you know, feeling as well, because he's also not that old and he still really wanted to still to, you know, create a company from scratch. Because if you, I would say too old, it can be very, very uh, tiring, right? You know, in the startup to, to, to create something from scratch again. And then, yeah, you approached me with this idea of, uh, of pricing because he, uh, he created this uh, data science team uh, at Contorion already um, uh, and they, like, like implemented a pricing frame, uh, like algorithm, and they've, they've been dealing with that, uh, pricing for three years already. And they also had like an uplift of 25%, you know, with, with the things they've been doing. And they did a lot of A B testing to find the right calibration, hyperparameters for the machine learning models and so on. Uh, and I just thought like, oh yeah, that's a nice idea. I had um, pricing already at university because you know when you're doing operation research, you also will focus with markdown management, revenue management, or also dynamic programming, right? So it has a lot of things to do with, with pricing because pricing is at the end of the day, a decision that you need to do in a, in a control theory, right? Um, and then I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And he was looking for a technical co-founder and I actually was looking also for a business co-founder, right? And uh, so that, that's why it was, it was a really good combination of us too. And yeah, I think we had this discussion, like I think around August or something like that. And then I was already clear, okay, I'm gonna resign from the company, right? Uh, and he was also, yeah, okay, I'm gonna leave October as well, right? So end of September. Um, and kind of like, luckily we left end of September both at the same time. And now we uh, basically started Price Loop, right? So Price Loop is, is, is my new venture together with Richard. Um, and uh, our goal is basically, uh, I would say we want to disrupt the pricing uh, industry, right, in a way, because um, yeah, as far as you know, there's many like AI software as a service uh, systems out there or, and, and, or not even that, but just AI software as a service in general, right? not even for pricing. And most of these pricing software are actually like more closed solutions. So basically, you know, you 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 uh, you get the data, and you you get the data from your client, your customer. They give you the data, and then they put it into your system. Maybe you have a login, right? Uh, and it's probably hosted on some cloud provider, and then you give out the price, right? So that's that's most of the service, or any other service. Community version service could be the same, right? You give the data, and then you get the labels and and so on, right? But what we actually want to do is um, we want to create like a pricing framework or library uh, at the end right so we basically want to like you know give data science teams pricing teams you know like a like a pricing framework uh, at the end of the day so that people you know uh, like you yourself maybe at OX will use us in the future right because it's so easy to create your own uh, kind of pricing strategies right and then of course we have commercial uh, solutions on top of that you know which which we uh, also will will um will you know, offer this to, to, to other customers, right? Because if they like to use our, our, our framework at the end of the day, you know, um, you know it, we, we are a company, right? We also need to finance ourselves in some way, right? Um, but the overall goal is actually to create a white box solutions, right? So we don't wanna take away, you know, 
the pricing manager, right? We don't want to, like, you know, tell them, hey, if you're going to use this, you don't need to, uh, like, uh, hire a pricing manager or you can fire the pricing manager. No, we want to give them a frame of a tool so that basically, you know, they can make better decisions with their pricing teams, right? And, you know, you, and pricing is a core component of many, many companies, right? And that shouldn't be, like, uh, like a black box solution. Yeah, that's uh, where I am so far. It's a, it's a nice, interesting ride. So, uh, <laughs> a long story, but uh, yeah. very interesting. So what what stood out to me was, uh, well, first of all, you mentioned Andrew Eng and this uh, course on Coursera. I think so many people ended up where they are now because of that course, myself including. Uh, yeah. Because, like it changed the the lives of so many people. So this is amazing. Um, and then indeed, like uh, I remember, I started for uh, following you on LinkedIn when you were already at Idealo, and then. Yeah. So many projects I found out, like open source project that you contributed, like your team contributed. Like, uh, I remember this, uh, um, I think there was a quality library, image quality library, then the yeah. duplication library, image duplication. Yeah, yeah that's uh, amazing. So to me, like I, uh, I saw that, uh, okay, this team is doing great on open source front, uh, like pushing out amazing stuff and then having also a lot of stars on GitHub, which shows that uh, a lot of people are interested that that's, uh, uh, that's a great job. And uh, yeah, I'm curious about your startup now. So you, 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 you said you just started it. So you, Richard and you, and do you have somebody else working with you now or? Yeah. yeah. So, uh... Um, I think I think the way how we start our startup is not very usual. <laughs> so uh, since since both of us are kind of experienced, we uh, so I mean we we just finalized our pre-seed funding. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we already, already. made uh, uh, four, uh, so we already signed four people. So mm -hmm. uh, um, one of the machine learning engineers just started this week already. So um, three is coming. We're gonna make two. Offers more. We want to be ten people, hopefully by Q two, two thousand twenty one, right? Uh, and then we are going to plan to do our like we're planning to do our um, like seed round in in twenty twenty one, right? Um, and then we're going to hire more people. So our goal is really to create a very like strong technical product team, mm -hmm. which really focuses on disrupting like one of the industries that we think at the moment is 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 kind of like close right like um not really open to to itself and we believe that you know uh the future is open you know open research and actually contribution from outside and basically contributing you know in ideas from many many different organizations and you know we see that direction from other startups that is building this direction like hugging face is a similar example right nlp is is getting so strong you know and people are like you know using it in production is because of the open research and all this stuff and i and at the moment i see i, I haven't seen that in pricing so far yeah but that's a amazing topic i see that uh, many many different companies e-commerce companies will benefit from that so that's uh, an amazing idea and uh, uh, I, I know that it will all work out. So now what, uh, what I hear is now you're already in the process of building a team. So you already, um, so some people already signed offers and uh, soon start working. So how, uh, how do you start uh, building a team? Like uh, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you approach this process? Like what should you do first? Like do you select a project first to do or you start immediately with hiring? Like how to approach yeah. this? process yeah i think i think i mean uh, it's hard to basically uh, kind of rationalize my my mind you know in in, mm -hmm. in some way uh i would say it's a combination of both um because some companies they just start with hiring people and then they build first right and all, some companies they need a big big plan now you know and then they're going to hire people uh what my or what our approach is uh you know this is together also you know aligning with my co-founder uh, and of course, I'm driving it from the technical perspective is, uh, of course, we have a project, we know what we're going to build, you know, but it's not it's still unclear, you know, it's unclear in a way that we don't know the, we know what the end goal should be, like the vision, right, but we just don't know which features, you know, will lead to this kind of things, right, and then we are hiring, like, different roles that would take us to that point to get a better understanding to our vision, right, um, and, as, and as, as you said, we're building, 
like a like a open framework, right? Like a library, which means you know it's a it's a strong like software engineering project, which means you know we need very good uh, software engineers, you know who who understands uh, you know like how to create like abstract libraries, right? Um, since we're dealing with machine learning, we need machine learning engineers, right? Since we're dealing with data, we need data engineers, right? Uh, we need a product manager who, you know, will prioritize this kind of things. We need designers who will, you know, guide also the API, you know, maybe we'll, we'll not maybe, but we will also build a front end for the commercial solutions, right? Uh, which means we need a UX UI uh, a person, you know, who will drive that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of, I would say, like, you know, roles that you need to think about before. But then also um, in the beginning, you know, you need to also think about, do you need very, um, like, I would say, uh, experienced people or inexperienced people versus also generalists versus specialists, right? So this is a question that you really need to ask. And, and our stage is, uh, we really need more experienced people because we are early stage startup, right? Which means we need to get traction as fast as possible so that we can raise our next funding, you know, and also get, you know, this market, product market fit with our, with our customers, right? And then the, the second thing is, uh, do we need generalists versus specialists? Uh, also in our case now, we need more generalists because, you know, as a startup, you know, we're, you, when you start, you have no lines of code, right? There's nothing, which means, you know, you need to do back end, front end, DevOps, uh, and whatever what, what happens there, right? Uh, whereas when you're a specialist, you're more like focused, okay, I just want to tune this specific hyperometer. Yeah, uh, like it's an interesting discussion, this uh, specialist versus generalist. And uh, I'm wondering, let's say, uh, if you were still at Idealo, so who would you prefer to hire back then? Like if you wanted to hire somebody in your team, like would it be a general specialist or would it matter actually? Yeah. When I started in Diallo or? Uh... No, like uh, w let's say you have a team, you're working yeah. already in a big company. Yeah. Um, in startup, it's clear, right? You want to yeah. have generalists, people who can do pretty much yeah. everything. But let's say it's a mid-sized, company like Idealo, it's not a yeah. large corporation, but it's yeah. already not a startup. For these kind of companies, uh, who would you prefer to hire? Yeah, I understand. Um, I think it depends as well, like where you are in the organization transformation, right? I think there's, there was this graph where you where you have like how much data driven is actually the company, right? If, if the data is uh, very immature, like at the beginning, you know, they don't have a data analyst or like a data team before, you know, it makes sense to hire like a data analyst uh, before and also the data engineers, you know, who build up the, the kind of backbone of this, right? And then over the time, you know, you can start to hire more different roles, you know, like uh, data scientists or machine learning engineers, right? Who will bring up the intelligence. I think there was also this famous uh, um, kind of pyramide, right? Where you basically on the, on the, on the uh, on the beginning, you know, um, on the bottom, you have this uh, data, right? You need to clean the data. You have very messy data, you clean the data. And then on top, like well, this very thin slice was actually the intelligence and then, and then the machine learning part, right? Um, at Idealo, uh, if I would map it to Idealo, the problem, um, I would say Idealo was uh, not very mature, but also not completely immature. It was in the middle of this transformation, right? So they knew uh, what kind of, uh, uh, they had data analysts before, then they had bus business intelligence people. They also had data engineering, you know, who, but who used to work very on, on a very old database, right? Um, and then when you see that, you know, you have to complement this, right? That means, okay, you don't need generalists in data science. So you need more specialists in data science because they, they, they uh, the topics are there, but you need people who work on that. But of course, you don't need super like specialists. So they need a little bit of towards the, a little bit of generous level because, you know, Idealo was very new in machine learning, which means, okay, these people I hired also need to like put things into production. You know, they need to cooperate with the data engineer because the data engineer didn't understand what machine learning was about, right? So, you know, you really need to, to, a kind of empathy to work with these people together to bring things into production, right? Um, for example, uh, if Ideal would already been that stage, you know, like they, they have already machine learning production, they, uh, 
they know how to use it, then you know it makes sense to go towards this super specialist, which, which would mean like more research oriented jobs, right? Because then you're only researching and not really like taking care of other stuff that uh, would make sense. Yeah, interesting, thanks. Yeah, going, going back to your, uh, to your current company, uh, uh, Priceloop, um, so you mentioned that you want to hire a lot of different people. You want to hire a product manager, you want to hire a uh, front-end engineer, back-end engineer, UI, UX, uh, data engineer. Uh, you said uh, that machine learning engineer also is starting soon. How, to how do you decide who to hire first? Like, or you already you know who to hire, like five different roles and you start hiring, or you'd rather focus on one specific role yeah. first? I mean, I mean, we open a couple of roles, but of course in my head, we already, you know, we have to start with certain roles, right? So uh, for example, uh, our first uh, goal was to hire machine engineers and software engineers, and actually machine engineers who are very close to be software engineers, you know? Like actually software engineers who know a lot about machine engineers at the end mm -hmm. of the day, right? Uh, and then over time, we can hire product managers more and also, you know, the data engineers, because at the beginning, you know, you have to think about, you need people who can work on the prototype, you know, who can work on the MVP, who do a lot of coding, you know, who work, work on the product, right? It doesn't make sense that you're going to hire like a UX UI designer when you have no work for them, right? Mm -hmm. So you really need to understand, okay, at which stage are you, right? And what kind of roles do you need now? to solve this problem, right? And then also, of course, what would you need these roles in the future going forward, right? You cannot hire someone just for six months, then you just need a freelancer. But we wanna create a company that is more sustainable and longer. So that means we, you know, we wanna keep these people longer and then do it just the six months. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is start with hiring engineers, backend engineers who know machine learning, and then they will build the backbone like all the, uh, um, they can also probably take care of the uh, data engineering, like all these data pipelines. Yeah. And then of course you then add on top of that, uh, maybe uh, analysts, uh, then um, UI UX product managers, right. but like you need to have this backbone and then you need to hire an engineer for that. Right. right. Okay, yeah. Um, so you mentioned a couple of uh, things, uh, uh, previously and one that i uh, that stood out to me was um so you want to build a strong product team right mm -hmm. and what does it mean to you a strong product team well i mean a, a strong product team is is for me a team uh that is building a product that actually at the end of the day a customer wants right mm -hmm. and strong strong means also very customer centric right uh which means also that we deliver features uh, very fast, right? Like, you know, and test these things out with our customers very fast. So that at the end of the day, you know, I want to build a product that a customer or a user would say, I love to use your product, right? Like it's the same thing, you know, when I create, we create these libraries, like, and put it open source. We are creating libraries so that people at the end of the day will say, wow, the thing that you built is very useful for us. You know, this is something that I would like to hear in the future. How do you build such, like, it's amazing, right? Being customer centric, uh, being able to iterate fast, get this feedback and make sure like you have this feed that customers really want to use what you're creating. But how do you make sure the team can do that? Like, uh, yeah. is there any secret sauce or? I mean, I wouldn't say there are secret sauce. It's just the way how you create a culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you look at high performance teams and culture, you know, with with different managers, it's actually just boils down to the culture that you create in this environment. And um, for me, is like we don't want to do a bullshit bingo, like scrum bullshit bingo, right? We we're not going to be like, hey, we're going to now hire an agile coach or whatever to do like you know agile bingo, right? But we want to have people who work towards a mission, like you know, and our my and our uh, job like for my co-founder and me is to you know keep these people motivated you know do everything as much as we can so that they can work on the problem right and of course you know help them when they have problems you know when they get lost with the vision right telling them again this is the vision that we want to go you know this is direction have very short feedback cycles in a way right um but then also of course you know 
like allowing them in the future to do open source and all stuff, right? So not a lot of companies here in, in Germany and overall, they are contributing to the open source community in some way, mm -hmm. right? Or they are doing stuff that is open. You know, this is this is something that I see really rare in, in, in startups as well in, in companies, right? Not everyone, like there are big corporations who would do that, right? But overall in Germany, I would say not a lot of companies are doing open source. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's uh, definitely true. And uh, um, you know, I'm wondering, like, with this open source, many developers want to do this. But when it comes to actually doing this, then uh, it's, uh, yes, sometimes it's difficult. Like, do you somehow try to give, like, some extra motivation? Like, how do you motivate people to actually go ahead and release something to open source? Or yeah. maybe with uh, writing articles, it's also something people want to do, but it's often difficult. Like you want to write an article, but then you see it and uh, you, like yeah. you end up doing something else instead of writing. So how do you motivate yeah. people to actually do that? I mean, if you if you look at my past teams, right, uh, most of them who joined me before they never did anything open source or mm -hmm. wrote an article before, right? Uh, you know, I I just like I, I'm a very pragmatic manager, so I. I do one-on-ones, you know, in this talk, I, I, I talk with them, hey, this, I give them suggestion, hey, this would be nice if you would write something like this, or this would be nice for the community if we do some open source like that. And overall, I, I just, you know, talk to them and give them inspiration, right? And the rest is up to them, right? And then they, for some of them started to write, you know, and then they were stuck and then I was telling them, hey, okay, maybe you could do something like this, then, you know, do that, right? And then they just took that, you know, as an idea. You know, I think if you really want to, like, you know, uh, create this kind of culture, you really need to work with these people, right? You really need to give them the inspiration because some of them, like, don't have the courage, basically, to start with that. And then if they, and if they found the courage to start with it, they maybe are a little bit clueless, right? There's so many articles out there. Where do I start, right? You as a manager, you can, you know, I myself, I wrote a lot of articles already. You know, I could start with telling them, Hey, if you want to do that, you know, you could like, you know, look at some of these articles that I think they are good, you know, try to do the introduction like this. Uh, oh, in the, in the main section, I think in a diagram like this would be nice. Give feedback, you know, and, and then it works, you know. <laughs> Basically by example, by setting ex an example, you said you already did that in the past and then you just uh, sharing this experience sharing this motivation that you had with the team and then it gets contagious and people just start following that and doing that as themselves yeah. right? even even another example is conferences before i created this uh, team at idealo uh, idealo was never at a machine learning or data conference you know mm -hmm. so if you think about the next last two or three years i could see that many of like you know idealos went to conferences and also uh, i I was very proud, for example, uh, Christopher Lennon. He was one of my first hires at Diado. He spoke at Strata San Francisco, you know, like mm, there were two wow, German companies like Diado and uh, the other one was Flink, you know. I was really okay. proud, you know, that, oh, wow, we made it to Strata San Francisco. <laughs> it's a pretty high bar. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, coming back to the hiring process, um, so at some point, of course, you first need to hire uh, engineers to make sure that uh, like the infrastructure is there, the data, like the processes for collecting data is there. But at some point, you want to hire a data scientist, right? Yeah. How do you do this? Uh, like, what is the, the process for you? How does it look like? What are the qualities you check? Uh, what, you, what are the things you're looking for in data scientists? Yeah, uh, I think... My, my checking is, is very, uh, I would say, uh, driven by, by how I, not how I feel, but you know, what I basically looking at the CVs, right? So I'm not, I don't have a schema where like a checklist where I say, yes, 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 right? He started at Stanford or Harvard or whatever, right? And he did computer science, he has a 4.0 GPA and blah, 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 right? But I would say, I look into like the team. So for example, if I already hired someone with this quality, I have to look at the CV with someone who has a different quality than the other one person before, right? But of course they are similar in some way. So they need a basis. So the basics is, for example, uh, you need to know how to program, right? So this is uh, for me, 
uh, like one on one. So if you don't if you don't if you don't know how to code, and especially if you don't know a lot about software engineering, you're already out in my in in, in my uh, process, right? Um, unless you are junior. So when you junior is a little bit different, but still, I require people to have a very high coding skills, like you know, programming skills. Um, and then other than that, you know, I look at stuff that you know seem to be interesting for the team. Oh, that person studied mathematics. Wow, cool. That means that person knows how to do math, right? Uh, that person already did some open source projects. Okay, they, they know the process of basically uh, the whole open source process, right? Um, or um, I know someone already did a Kaggle challenge, right? But not this current challenges, but really like a real challenge. So it means, wow, that person work under pressure, it's competitive, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then I combine this thing together and I say, Okay, this could be a good fit to the team. You know, that could be a good fit to 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 the to the skill set that we're looking at right in the future. And then uh, usually what I do is I do like a first interview where I just talk about you know all the experiences, uh, whether that person is interesting. You know, we are also people at the end of the day, and we have to work together. You know, if someone is just plain boring, you know, this is also very difficult for the team. You know, that that person would also need a hobby, right? I don't know, going to the cinema, doing some sports. Or whatever hacking is also a hobby, uh, but it, that person needs to do something. Otherwise, it's. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, you you really work more time with with that person than basically your girlfriend or your wife. You know, so you spend much more time with them than than your personal, uh, 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 like you know, the one the person that you love actually, right? So and that's that's why you know you really need to understand that person really well, you know, and um, and then I also ask like ten. Uh, basic machine learning questions. Um, um, some of the questions are also in your interview uh, guide that you uh, have on GitHub. Uh, so I'm not going to disclose them, <laughs> but, but, but they are very one basic. Of these, so basically there are 160 questions, 10 of them are there. So if somebody goes through all of them, then they will pass your interview, right? Yeah, uh, I would say um, they should not uh, copy your answer 101 because <laughs> yes so the, I, the answers uh, like probably it's a good idea to actually look at the questions and try to answer right, themselves right. Right. But what i because what answers. i do is i yeah what i do is i ask one question and then from towards this i ask a random question <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. and is, uh, when it comes to coding to programming is there any specific um, uh, like process that you follow for checking or how do you do this yeah, so what we then do is um, uh, the second interview is basically a homework assignment. So I send uh, out a homework, which is not really difficult. And then, you know, they send me the code, uh, like, you know, whether this is a Jupyter notebook or whatever, you know, and then I can check a little bit already. And to be honest, from this simple task, you could already see how much, like, how are people working, you know? For example, uh, quotes. Some people, you know, they just don't make sure that quotes are like like uh, the same as everything right you know that's like double quote or single quotes right mm -hmm. but then when i see that people are using single quotes and they are a double quote and they are a single quote again you know i would already see okay that person is not really taking care of the code you know like 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 writing small the code. things yeah small yeah. things you know these kind of small things you can also see also all naming you know how do this person do the naming? How, will that person do some abstraction of class as well? Or is that person using pipeline? So, you know, you, from this simple test, you could already see how someone would work, you know, in the future, because these are small things that I would check because th these small things makes a difference at the end. Yeah, so basically whoever is listening, if you want to go to that company, make sure you use <laughs> same quotes throughout all the code. <laughs> I would say it's not my company. It's, I think it's for every company out there. You know? okay. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting. Yeah, it's something I personally uh, didn't actually uh, like. It just didn't occur to me to look at these things. But that's an interesting perspective. Uh, we uh, just wanted to remind that we, you can ask that a question. So uh, this is in chat. So let me copy and paste the link again. So if somebody didn't see it, it's in chat. So you can uh, go there and ask uh, uh, that a question. And we already have one question. It was asked even before uh, we uh, started this in, uh, in our Slack community from Umesh. Uh, so the question is uh, for a company that already has an established data team, how, how do 
decide which project to take like you probably have a big list of uh, different projects initiatives yeah. how to pick the one that uh, to work on i mean um this is always a very i would say difficult question it's risky right because let's say you have 100 projects right uh and you have only uh, limited resources which means you, you need to pick the one that has the highest return on these uh, ones right and basically what i do is i have this um metrics like a two by two metrics uh, you know that i learned over time at Pivot as well where if you on the one the x i axis uh, the y axis you have the business impact and on the x axis you have the technical visibility right and then from this kind of uh, like two dimensions you can map up some of the projects you know and you go into like you know different dimensions like when you think at business impact you see is it impacting revenue or uh, cost right so these are the two driving factors and cost uh, revenue and you know you can also distinguish it as well, right? And the technical feasibility is then driven. Is there a lot of legacy involved? Do we need uh, a lot of roads like data engineers? Um, do we have a data dictionary? Uh, is it problem solvable, right? For example, mm -hmm. uh, if you think about self-driving cars, it's not a very you know easily solvable problem with just data science, right? So you need much more than data science. You know, you need hardware, you need infrastructure, you need the whole ecosystem behind that, right? Uh, or is that something, you know, that you can say, okay, I can drive this kind of things, right? Um, and then from there, I would just, you know, prioritize this list and then um, look at the top three or something like this, and then like basically work on the top three. And very important, just don't work on one project because if you work on one project for one year and it's gonna fail, you know, you're gonna fail <laughs> with this one project, right? Because at Idealo, to be honest, uh, you only saw the successful project that we open source, right? We did. We had a mm -hmm. lot of projects that, that of course, uh, no one saw it because it never went live, right? In this kind of projects, you know, uh, it's 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 fine. The the only thing is you need to decide on a project, and because you think that it is like has a high business impact and it's technically feasible, and then you also need to iterate fast, right? To work towards the goal very fast, and then if you see that these things will not work and failing, then you should really like, you know, cut it down and try the other idea. So it's fail fast. Okay, so iterate fast, fail fast. Yeah. Uh, and basically it uh, also bring us back to the topic we discussed previously of being strong, strong product teams, right? So this is yeah. one of the aspects there. We have a couple of questions. I'll share my screen now. So, and... Uh... Yes, so this uh, so this question from Pratap, maybe we can take it. Uh, um, uh, uh, so if I'm about to set up a complete d data science AI team on product space, from where I need to start with this guide? So probably it's a question not for me, but uh, to you, Dad. So yeah, I mean, we, we asked this, uh, I mean, I answered this kind of a little bit already, right, with, uh, with my price loop question. So really, you need to think about what's your product, right? Is your product a software engineering project? You need software engineers at the beginning, right? If your project is just a consultancy, uh, then you can hire any role. Mm -hmm. um, um, a question from Kai. Um, how do you see the role of corporate IT regarding data science? I'm not sure I completely understand it. Uh, do, do you have an idea what corporate IT is? So probably maybe something uh, like in uh, yeah. companies like Axel Springer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the corporate in a in a corporate company like Axel Springer, it has a corporate IT. Uh, um, to be honest, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, this corporate IT system uh, makes sense um, for like a company like Axel Springer going on forward in the future, um, because if uh, Axel Springer is turning into a tech company, right? Uh, the everything that is within the company is driven by technology, right? So there will not be like this central corporate IT department that you have, right? And basically, you know, the corporate IT will be like a DevOps role, you know, within a whole technology company. And then, you know, data science will play a part within this technology organization. So I hope this answers the question. <laughs> And to me, I learned actually that in, I haven't worked uh, in a big corporations. So now I know that uh, in some corporations, there's this corporate IT department. Yeah. Um, so another question is, how do you keep a good team? So because good people tend to get great offers and might leave 
soon so how do you keep them i mean this is the this is the question that i always had so far uh, i didn't have the problem of people leaving me because i was ins always ensuring that people are uh, getting paid fairly uh, and also have interesting projects right and if you are going to balance these things thing two things out then uh, you know you can keep your people for example when you start to give pro people like shitty projects or when you you know a kind of like a micromanage them right then they they will leave you someday right and then also when you're not going to pay them fairly and all the stuff right then this is also a, a big problem right um that is something that i learned over the time and um basically this is what actually basically kept the people like working for me so very simple ingredients actually yeah two things pay well and give interesting projects right um so that will you prefer a mathematician or a computer specialist for a machine learning position and computer specialist probably um, somebody who graduated from a computer science department yeah. Uh, as I said, this question doesn't matter because, you know, <laughs> yes. it, it, the, uh, basically, if you are mathematicians, you need us to, to code, right? Which means you be, need to be on par with the computer scientists. If you're a computer scientist, you need to understand the math behind uh, the machine learning system, right? Which is actually obviously not so complicated, right? And then, you know, it doesn't matter, actually. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, you need to have a certain set of skills and it doesn't matter where you pick the skills, right? Was it uh, from you know, your university? You could, you could also not study at all, right? There are many yeah, people who exactly. don't study at all and they are very good, so. Yeah, thank you. So how to deal with the hype on management when building a data science team? So it's probably like okay. a question of expectation management. Yeah. Um, I mean, you. this is the problem. When you are when you're a new company, um and, uh, and not a new company but when you're a company and you create this new data science team everyone will expect a lot of you because you know they they know that wow ai they read these things they can do so much it will like increase our revenue and, and cost and so on if 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 you you know if someone is opening this new data science team you know you really need to communicate as much as possible and also do a lot of education i would say courses with with higher management to say this is what ai can do and this is what ai can't do otherwise you will have so many expectations that you know you, you will kind of you are expected to fail in some way so basically work with management and uh, explain them right? yeah um so uh, what do you think about this establishment of bi di uh, bi di product management role so i think this is a question about this uh, maybe a new uh, trend uh, yeah. data product manager yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah so what do you think about uh, this role uh, i would actually like to have it um, especially here in germany I think you know our pr most of the product managers are not really good. I mean, there are some really top product managers who understands what be, uh, like who are data driven and they understand uh, what machine learning is all about. But most of the product managers are really like business driven, right? And basically, uh, you know, if you're a product manager, you should also be tech oriented. And I, I really like actually the case that, for example, you know, in the US, they are much more tech oriented product managers. Basically, they were seven years or they were machine learning engineers before, and then they become product managers, right? And here, there are many people who, you know, doing marketing or do you, they may, they also just did project management and now they're product management, but project management is not a product management role, you know, because project managing a project is different from managing a product. Do you have a couple of more minutes uh, or you need to go to, to some other meeting? Uh, one, one question is okay. Okay. Yes, so uh, have last question is uh, how to start doing data science in a new company when data quality uh, and organization in the company is not good? What are the required steps before start hiring? Okay, so the question was how to start doing data science in a new company when data quality organization in the company is not good? Um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, I would say kind of difficult because if the data is not really good, uh, you know, it can be very challenging to create a data science team. And if you are, uh, if you are doing that, you know, if, if you are at the stage, then you really should basically hire data engineers and basically uh, um, to basically clean up the data, right, in a way, and the data quality as well, have a proper data quality process. And if you really don't have clean data, you know, 
you can also create new data. So for example, for example, for a lot of our projects at Idealo, we didn't have the data, right? And then we started to collect the data. And this like times, you know, so basically sometimes it takes a half a year or a year to collect enough data to basically solve this uh, problem. But you have to start someday. Because many companies, they just think, you come in as a data scientist, you have to, we think that we have the data already, right? And then you're gonna just do that, but it's not gonna work this way. Yes, I can only agree with that. And uh, it also brings us back to your point that we need to have this backbone uh, with data pipelines and all that uh, before, you know, thinking about machine learning and hiring data scientists. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot for uh, taking time to come here and share your knowledge with us and your expertise. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you everyone for attending and for your questions. And uh, yeah, we will put a video out soon. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all I think. Yeah. Any last word from you? No, thanks for having me. I think it's always nice talking to you with uh, Alexei. So uh, see you then someday live in person uh, after Corona. <laughs> Hope it will be soon. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Goodbye. All right. See ya. Bye.